All right, so just very briefly, uh, Dean, uh, who's visiting us, is currently an assistant professor at MIT. Before that, he was, he was further away, phone away, got it. Uh, before that, he was a member of the core data science team at Facebook. Um, he's a statistician and social scientist. Uh, he does a lot of empirical work, including uh, large uh, field experiments and observational studies, uh, which is really cool. Um, he's interested in how interactive technologies affect human behavior. Uh, he's done some work in causality, and um, his work has appeared at many academic venues, but also it's been covered by uh, more popular venues like uh, The New Scientist, NPR, and even Wired Magazine, which I think is really cool. And so with that, uh, I'll let you take it away. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, it's uh, my pleasure to be here. Um, this is my first time visiting uh, UMass Amherst, um, so it's a great opportunity to get to know um, the, the faculty and, and students here. Um, just so that I have a little bit of context for um, what audience I'm speaking to, because I, I present this work to a few different audiences, how, how many folks here are in uh, computer science? Okay, so uh, and, uh, I guess that's like 90%. Okay, so that's, uh, that's, that's, that's useful. Okay, great. So basically what I'm going to do today is talk about um, uh, where we're going to end up is doing analysis of large collections of randomized experiments run, in this case, by internet companies. Though we're thinking about all kinds of applications for these techniques, including the things like microbiome experiments. But I'm going to focus primarily on randomized experiments on Facebook. As sort of a path uh, there, I'm going to think about one particular experiment that we ran um, on Facebook that will help sort of set up some of the ideas that I think are not as familiar to computer scientists, in particular, this tool that we're going to use, instrumental variables, um, in order to analyze these experiments. Um, and so, uh, uh, so this work is, is really uh, where we're going to end up is this joint work with um, Alex Pashakovich, which is this working paper. Um, but the experiment I'm going to present before that is uh, joint work with Rene Kizilchech and Eitan Bakshi. Um, and Eitan and Alex are, are both at Facebook. Alex is actually in this weird position of being a behavioral economist. His PhD is in economics, who's somehow ended up uh, in Facebook AI research. So I think he's the token social scientist uh, at Facebook AI research now. Okay. So yeah, the big picture is just um, some, some basics of, of how we would actually do causal inference for, for peer effects using instrumental variables. Uh, doing that analysis from a, for a single field experiment uh, that we conducted on Facebook. And then I'm going to think about uh, what if we didn't have just one experiment, um, but we had a very large collection of experiments that were not designed for any particular purpose, um, but uh, uh, that, uh, not designed for the particular purpose that we have in mind, but were designed for other reasons. Um, but maybe we can still make use of them for our own purposes. OK. Um, so the, kind of the setting I'm thinking about is something like this, where uh, you know, this is designed to represent uh, Facebook, um, uh, and how the experience of one, uh, one user of a service like Facebook uh, is, is really going to be determined by uh, some of the, the behaviors uh, of their peers, right? So that this is a networked product where the benefits of using the product uh, happen uh, in part because either you consume content from other people, you uh, produce content that's consumed by other people, or there's some other sort of social interaction that occurs. Um, so, um, kind of, kind of the setting we're thinking about is basically where we have a large collection of randomized experiments. And so, what do we mean by having a large collection of randomized experiments? In that, there's going to be uh, some set of users um, where there's you know some number of users per experimental condition who are assigned to some number of experimental groups, um, k, and so. Uh, the idea is that, for example, uh, this might arise from actually we're running one experiment comparing uh, two particular versions of, say, a newsfeed ranking algorithm. Um, and then uh, we also run another experiment comparing uh, a couple other versions, et cetera, et cetera. And so uh, we can imagine uh, both the number of observations per experimental condition uh, growing, but also the number of experiments growing. And so uh, when we start to think about things like asymptotics here, um, Actually, mainly what we're going to think about is the case where the number of experiments we have is going to go to infinity. 
Um, probably not going to be that large of a number, maybe, maybe hundreds, maybe a couple thousand. Um, but it's a little bit of a different setting than the case where we've run a single A-B test and we're going to compare A and B. Uh, but maybe there's more that we can learn from that. Okay. And so uh, our goal in this setting is going to be to try to learn some causal relationships that are not directly targeted by these experiments. So one of the great things about um, uh, field experiments, especially in the internet industry, is that it's really easy to sometimes run an A-B test that answers exactly the question that you have. Right? You just compare the status quo with some new policy, compare the status quo with some new design, you compare the status quo with some new algorithm, um, and maybe that's the policy question of interest. But for more uh, complex questions, including ones about like how does this uh, whole service, how does this whole ecosystem work, um, things might be a little bit different. And so um, the, uh, in, in, in the setting we're thinking about, uh, we're imagining something like this, right? So um, we might be interested in learning about the causal effect of uh, people's exposure to newsfeed stories from their friends on their content production. Um, but we think that this relationship is confounded by some third variables. For example, um, how many photos my, I'm consuming from my close friends uh, might depend on events that are happening in my kind of local geographic and uh, social neighborhood, which presumably is also affecting how much content I'm producing, right? If there's like a sporting event that my friends and I attend, this might produce more content from my peers that I see, and then I also am producing more content during that time period. Similarly, we might wonder about the relationship of ice cream uh, cones sold on, on drownings. Um, there's a positive association uh, between these two. Um, but we might worry that there's basically some kind of confounding variable like the temperature um, uh, that affects both people's desire to eat ice cream cones and to um, go swimming. Um, and so uh, the idea is that though we don't ha necessarily have experiments designed specifically to learn about this relationship, we're going to utilize a large collection of experiments um, as shocks to this variable. Uh, friend story scene. And so the setting we're going to be in is one that looks like this, where we want to find some instrumental variable z that is a shifter of the causal variable of interest. Here in the example I just gave, uh, that's the number of uh, stories from your friends you see on Facebook. It could be a more specific category, like the number of photo posts you see from close friends on Facebook, for example. Um, so that variable is, is being shifted by some, uh, some variable that we call an instrumental variable z. Um, and hopefully that instrumental variable um, is as good as randomly assigned. So it's not caused by some other confounding variables. We're going to be able to more or less guarantee that because we're going to use uh, randomized experiments that we happen to have lying around as our instrumental variables. So we actually know how z was assigned and it was assigned via um, a hash function. Right? Um, and then we also need to uh, assume that z is only affecting y, in this case, um, the, the content being produced by uh, some user, uh, via these intervening variables, these causal uh, variables of interest. Um, it doesn't have some other uh, me mechanism via which it affects y. Now, in this example I just gave, where x is how many, say, friends stories you see, or how many uh, photo uh, posts you see from close friends. Uh, it might be really hard to find experiments that just shift x um, and aren't shifting y via other mechanisms. But as we expand the number of variables that we include in x, x can be really multivariate, this might get more and more plausible. Okay. So that's the kind of setting we're in. And, and this really is an example of what's, um, in, in the simplest case, where, say, z is, is uh, is binary. Um, this is often called an encouragement design. So the idea is that uh, we randomly assign uh, units to some encouragement to a behavior of interest. So uh, for example, we might wonder whether uh, if you study more, you do better on the test. Well, um, usually, uh, even as a professor, you're not in the position to uh, just directly assign students to hours studying, um, right? You can encourage them to study more. So we could randomly assign students 
to uh, be encouraged to study, which then we think perhaps is only going to affect their performance on the test maybe via their actual studying behavior, right? Um, similarly, a, a lot of analysis of clinical trials has the same character. We're interested perhaps in the actual biological effect of taking some drug on, on some outcome of interest, but um, we don't actually get to force everyone to take the drug or not. In fact, there can be two-sided non-compliance. We might be interested in the effect of uh, uh, Advil on the onset of Alzheimer's, um, something that has been widely studied. Now, people who uh, we assign to, to say, we say, hey, you should maybe take Advil. We think it might um, uh, prevent Alzheimer's. They might take Advil or they might not. And then some of the people in the control condition who we didn't encourage, just Advil you can buy anywhere. So uh, these, these people are taking ibuprofen as well. So we can have this kind of two-sided non-compliance. Now, analysis of these sorts of encouragement designs um, uh, can, can take a couple of forms. One is to just look at the total effect of the encouragement, right? So what is the effect of uh, just encouraging somebody to study on their performance on the test? That is that we're interested in summaries of quantities of this kind, where uh, this, first, um, this first term here is the outcome for unit I, that is their score in the test, uh, if uh, they're assigned to be encouraged to study. And then this other potential outcome here is their outcome if they were not encouraged to study. Right? And so presumably, if uh, this encouragement does in fact cause them to study, and studying in fact is, uh, has a causal relationship um, with performance on the test, we should be able to detect it by looking at summaries of this sort of effect. For example, we could look at the average of this over uh, many people. And we can estimate this quite easily by looking at a difference in means between treatment and control. Um, often what we care about more is the, is the effect on uh, effect of the behavior itself, right? So um, that in this picture, uh, that we care actually about the effect of, of x on y here, which unfortunately in this slide I've labeled d. Um, <laughs> so d and x are going to be substituted a little here in a couple of cases, sorry. Um, so here uh, uh, we might be interested in actually what's the effect of studying itself on the outcome. And uh, so the idea is, can we actually use this random shock created by z to estimate the effect of d on y? And yes, we can. Um, in, in fact, the simplest way of, of doing this, um, so it, it's so simple that it, in the internet industry, I've seen a lot of people who have never encountered instrumental variables just sort of do this, is to divide one number by another. It's pretty simple, right? We just divide the effect of our encouragement on the outcome by the effect of our encouragement on this endogenous causal variable of interest. We just divide uh, the difference in scores on the test between treatment and control by the difference in number of hours studied between treatment and control. So that's, that's kind of our estimator. Um, so how are we going to use this here? Basically, uh, in the first example I'm going to show you, uh, we're going to use this kind of technique to uh, estimate um, uh, peer effects, that is, effects of the behavior of peers on some focal individual who I'll sometimes call the ego. This isn't a, a Freudian term. It's just a way of designating which is the focal individual as opposed to their peers. Right? And so the strategy we're going to use here is to randomly assign vertices in the network to some encouragement to a behavior of interest, and then examine how some focal individual, some ego, is affected by the assignments of their peers and thus also the behaviors of their peers. So um, especially in, in groups like things like villages or departments or schools, um, these ki kinds of designs are starting to be used more and more in development, uh, work by political scientists and economists, and also uh, in labor economics. Um, uh, what we really want to do here, of course, is estimate the effect of the peer behaviors, not just the encouragement. And this will be especially important as I get into the meta-analysis portion of this work, where the experiments that we start with, are we don't even really know what they did. They're just a whole bunch of randomizations that we have lying around. And so their effects are not going to be particularly interpretable. Right? Uh, instead, we want to put this all on the scale of uh, these peer behaviors or exposure by the ego to peer behaviors. Right? In my example earlier, it's not, the peer, it's not peer behavior directly how many photo stories are being produced by my friends. It's my exposure to them. How many photos from friends am I seeing? But it's still a peer effect. 
So in the first example here that I'm going to show, we're interested in estimating the effects of receiving uh, feedback on Facebook. So when somebody shares content on social media, um, they can often receive some kind of feedback or reply behavior from their peers, right? And so um, they might get a like or a comment, or now there's all kinds of reactions or stickers, et cetera, all this kind of stuff you could be sending to people. But we're just going to be focusing on likes on comments, which is what existed during the time this experiment was conducted. So uh, if I receive this kind of feedback, this might function as a sort of uh, reward for my behavior. I've just you know, uh, engaged, in, engaged in this behavior of broadcasting some content, and maybe uh, I experience receiving likes as a kind of reward for that behavior that encourages me to do it again in the future. So I might share more content in the future. I might also just sort of um, reply to people. If you comment on my post, um, I might reply to you. Right? I might actually just comment on my own post in, a, in reply. Or I might like your comment, for example. I also might be engaged in some sort of generalized reciprocity or in-kind peer effects. Right? If I'm getting uh, more feedback from other people, maybe I start giving more feedback to other people. Right? So this would be um, all these things kind of would contribute to some sort of virtuous cycle in uh, content production. Um, in social media, right? So we might think this is a key part of how these services uh, sustain or grow engagement over time. So how actually are we going to use the ideas that I mentioned so far to try to estimate the effects of receiving feedback? Well, we're going to use this little fact here. This is the same post by my co-author, Eitan Bakshi, um, just displayed in two different ways. So either on, on the left, it's displayed with all the existing feedback it's received expanded. Well, Eitan really just commented on his own post here. But you know, he's got some, he did get some likes. right? And, and also, this opens up this text box here, which encourages the viewer to write a comment on this post. Whereas here, basically, this post at the same time is uh, sort of summarized. right? This feedback is, is collapsed into this numerical summary. And there is uh, no open text box to write a comment. It's still actually one click to like this post or to comment on this post. Because as soon as you click comment here, it'll open this text box and insert your cursor into it. So really, we've just changed like, the salience of commenting. We've changed the overall target size of the comment box. Right? It's like, easier to click on things that are larger. Right? That's Fitt's law. Um, and so, uh, so as a fact that I'll show you evidence of later, uh, displaying a post in this style on the left results in higher feedback rates. Um, if we show Aton's post to his friends in this style, he's going to receive more feedback from peers than if we show it in this style. OK. So how do we actually use this fact? How is this sort of implemented in the context of uh, this experiment? So we're kind of back to this picture. One way of doing this sort of experimentation right, is that we think about everyone has a coin. We flip the coin. We decide whether they're in treatment or control. Actually, what we're going to do is something a little bit more sophisticated that allows us to really uh, increase the precision of, uh, of the estimates we're going to get out of this. And so let's just focus on this one person. They're our ego. And we're going to flip a coin for them. And so that coin then is going to determine uh, how their content is displayed to their peers. That is, it functions as an encouragement or you could say, in the reverse, discouragement to giving them feedback. Right? Now, this person right here, who's their friend, is encouraged to give them feedback. They're not necessarily encouraged to give their other friend feedback. And they themselves are actually subject to a different randomization that determines whether uh, their friends, which include this person, are encouraged to give them feedback. That is, So the randomization of some ego determines how their content is displayed to other people. And uh, if you take a look at the paper for this, we uh, show how uh, this kind of experimental design uh, can, can really be an improvement over cases where we would just sort of encourage people to give feedback to all of their peers. This can give us a lot more statistical power and precision uh, and also some additional clarity. Okay. So um, uh, that is, it sort of fits into our overall design recommendation for these sorts of uh, experimental designs to uh, try to actually uh, randomize um, uh, vertices to uh, a specific behavior targeted at a particular individual. And that's going to give us more statistical power. And also, that really we're using a pretty minimal encouragement here. right? Basically, 
Uh, we're just hitting Aton's friends with a feather, right? Saying, oh, okay, we're going to make it slightly easier for you to comment on Aton's post. Right? What does this do? This means that this is going to allow us to estimate the effect of marginal peer behaviors. We're going to learn about comments and likes, the effects of them on Aton that could or could not occur under policies that are pretty similar to our current one. So they sort of tell us what would happen if we slightly changed policy. Like, what is the marginal uh, effect? And then also, this sort of minimizes the potential for reactance, right? It's not like, uh, you know, if we start paying your friends to like your posts, uh, there could be other sources of reactance. They might decide to tell you that we offered them money to like your posts, et cetera, right? So by keeping this very minimal, uh, which is really possible given the large sample size that we're going to work with, I think this creates also a, uh, a more plausible assumption that the only effect of this encouragement is to cause people to receive uh, more likes and comments. Okay. So how we actually implemented this is slightly more complicated than what I just said in that uh, rather than this being a binary, just simple A-B test, we in fact have a factorial design where this is a two by three design. So we're going we're gonna to change two different factors that apply to posts at different times. So here uh, in the conversation salience factor, when there is existing feedback, we decide, this is what I just showed you before, we decide whether to show it or to collapse it. Um, or uh, if there's not existing feedback, we call this an encourage initiation factor. So for posts that don't yet have feedback, we decide whether basically to open this comment box or not. Right? And either we do this always, never, or then there's this weird sometimes, which was the status quo, which is just only if it's in position one in newsfeed do we open it, otherwise we close it. But you can just think of this as the sort of intermediate position of this factor. Okay. So we, ran, we did this uh, randomized experiment um, uh, in, in 2012. Um, so the data I'm going to be showing you is a, as a, a global sample of around 50 million egos. Um, of course, this also includes the behavior of all their peers, uh, which is, I think, closer to 900 million uh, people. Um, so these are the focal users whose outcomes we're going to analyze. Um, of course, most of them are actually in a condition that's a status quo at the time, so there's not an equal experiment. There's not number equal number of people in all six cells. Um, these people had to have created at least one post, either right before the experiment or during the experiment, because that's the only way that the experiment applies to them, is if they have content that's being shown to other people. And then uh, the Stanford IRB wanted us to limit it to uh, people who are 18 plus. And then they have to have one friend who used Facebook on the web, because just as I showed you in, in these uh, interface changes, at the time this only applied to the version of Facebook uh, on a computer as opposed to on mobile phones. OK, so then we take this data and we're, we aggregate it in order to do some analysis. So we have this assignment Z, which is this two by three design which uh, governs how people's posts are displayed to their peers. Then we have a bunch of covariates that we're going to use. It's not, su not super important. That's just to increase precision. Then we have uh, how much feedback the ego received during the experimental period. And then we have a bunch of outcomes that we're interested in, including like, how much they post. So um, uh, then in order to, to make this all work, we need to make these assumptions. So um, we need uh, something like that there's no interference in the network so that my outcomes aren't affected by other people's treatment assignments. Okay, that actually can't be quite true because the whole thing that we're studying is pure effects. So uh, we're generally going to make also a weaker version of this assumption, which is just that this sort of interference has to be small compared with the direct effects. Um, uh, we need some sort of uh, what's sometimes called by economists mainly an exclusion restriction. You could also call this, I think, um, uh, a complete mediation assumption. That is that this experimental assignment, Z, has all of its effects on the outcomes we care about uh, by changing how much feedback people receive. Okay? And then um, uh, some more kind of technical things about instrumental variables um, that affect a little bit the interpretation of our estimates. So we're going to estimate the, the quantities of interest using two stage least squares, which is just to say that we're interested in uh, this equation here. In particular, we're interested in uh, the effect of D on Y, which in this model is going to be this parameter gamma. Um, now, uh, as we talked about earlier, D and Y have some common causes that are omitted here, right? Like um, uh, right now there's some more events going on, and so uh, uh, I'm, uh, I'm posting high-quality content, so I'm getting more feedback. 
And then I have new things to post about later because there's still this event happening, say, in my life, right? So, um, so just estimating this equation isn't going to work for us. Instead, we want to use the random variation induced by this experiment to estimate the effect of d on y. And so uh, we instead uh, estimate this equation using d hat as estimated by this equation, where we're just using the variation in d that's induced by z, which is our um, design matrix of instruments. Okay. So um, earlier I, showed, I said that there was this fact that displaying these posts these different ways results in different amounts of feedback. Here's some evidence for that fact. So here we're looking at um, uh, the effect of this experimental uh, randomization on how much feedback egos receive. And so we see that, yeah, if they're in high conversation salience versus low conversation salience, they receive more feedback. And similarly, if they're, uh, if, uh, they're in the encourage initiation condition, right, which is opening the comment box for their peers when they don't yet have any feedback, they're also receiving more uh, feedback. Okay. So yes, as expected, these encouragements are causing people to receive more feedback. Um, one of the things that's nice about this is actually, I said earlier, we use this super minimal encouragement, like hitting people with a feather. Right? This is only possible really because we have a very large sample size. Right? Because our, our, our squared for this first stage, the effect of these, this experiment on these endogenous variables, this endogenous variable feedback received, is you know, 10 to the negative 5. So it's only because we have this very large sample size that we're able to um, precisely estimate this first stage and use that variation in feedback received to then estimate um, the effects of feedback received on the outcomes that we care about. Okay. So now, now let's look, look at the effects on these outcomes. Okay. So here, this is uh, what we've estimated with two stage least squares, and this is on a, a log log scale. Uh, so we can think of these as elasticities or basically percent percent changes. Um, so first, let's think about the effect of uh, receiving more feedback on kind of the two uh, most directly affected outcomes. Right, so what are the largest possible effects we should observe? If you give me another comment on my post, what, what's the thing I'm most directly going to do? I might reply to your comment, or I might like your comment. So that's what these two variables are. So comments on my own posts and likes of comments on my own posts. And so we see that actually about a 1% increase in the amount of feedback I receive causes me to produce 1% more comments on my own posts and 1% more likes on the comments on my own posts. Okay, this is kind of obvious. This isn't super exciting. The reason I've included this is because uh, this is going to provide a scale for how large our other effects are. This is often difficult to conceptualize uh, are these big or small effects. Okay, and so um, uh, here we see that essentially the effects on the outcomes we care a lot about more, uh, uh, care about a lot more, uh, giving feedback to other people and posting more are essentially one order of magnitude smaller. So uh, a 10%. Uh, increase in the amount of feedback that I receive causes me to give other people 1% um, more comments, 1% more likes, and slightly less than 1% more posts. And, and I produce, in general, slightly less uh, than 1% more posts. To really understand what's going on here, because I think probably to this audience, um, except for those of you who work in causal inference, uh, instrumental variables is, is like a new concept probably. So let's think about what we're really doing here, because it's like maybe I've made this sound fancier than it really is. Um, it, you know, again, we're just kind of dividing one number by another, but it's, I've made it more complicated by having this two by three design. This is what we're doing. Okay, each one of these points here represents one of the experimental conditions. So there's six points. They're scaled according to their size. So this one you can see is the status quo. It's the largest, right? And each one here is just represented by its mean on the causal variable that we care about, feedback received, and its mean on one of the outcomes we care about, posts. And then we're basically just fitting a line through them. Now, the estimates that we have here are slightly fancier than that, but basically this is the slope of this line. Okay? We're just saying we've indu our, our experiments have induced some truly random variation in the variable we care about, and we're going to use that to estimate uh, the, the effect of that variable on the outcome. Okay. So this definitely gives very different answers than if you just use observational data. If we just said, hey, let's look at people who receive varying amounts of feedback, and then how much content do they produce, 
uh, et cetera, you get very different answers. So for, for the things that we really cared about, actually the observational analysis uh, would dramatically overstate uh, the effects of receiving feedback. And actually for a couple of these other variables, it could dramatically understate it. Okay. So I don't want to spend too, too much time on the details of this, um, of this experiment. I'll just say that uh, these effects are pretty robust. You can use either just the conversation salience factor, the incursion initiation factor. You can use a lasso in the first stage to try to detect uh, heterogeneous treatment effects. You get very similar uh, results overall. Um, but the idea is kind of going back to, back to this picture. We designed an experiment to produce variation in feedback received in order to be able to estimate the effect of feedback received on, say, posting. But companies like Facebook, Google run thousands of experiments a year. I think in 2015, Hal Varian says Google ran 10,000 experiments. And I think Facebook's probably on the same scale. right? So um, can't we use some of those existing experiments to estimate these relationships also? And so that's, that's what we're going to do uh, next. And so in the empirical setting I'm thinking about, we're basically thinking about newsfeed ranking experiments where users are randomized to uh, different algorithms for ranking content available in newsfeed, right? When you log into Facebook, um, you get information about the things that your friends have shared. Um, often your friends have shared or done more things than you're actually going to consume. Um, and so uh, that content is ranked. Um, and Facebook is constantly trying to improve the ranking of content. Um, so that it's more relevant, um, et cetera. So there's a lot of these tests that are small changes to parameters of this ranking model. And what we're going to do is try to estimate the effect of me being exposed to different types of content in newsfeed, like the example I gave earlier, me seeing more photos from close friends versus, say, photos from less close friends um, on my content production. And so uh, we're going to assume that essentially most of these experiments have most of their effects uh, via uh, exposure to some different types of content. Um, so this is the kind of empirical setting that we're thinking about here. Right? So that picture that I just sh showed you, we're going to be thinking of pictures more like this now. Right? Each of these points is a single experiment. Well, it's a ex single experimental group, I should really say. Right? So each, ex each experiment usually needs to involve at least two conditions for there really to be randomization. But we're just going to show each individual group here. And I'm showing them according to their means on two of the different um, causal variables that we're interested in. So you can think like, say, x1 could be uh, the number of, um, uh, of photos that you see posted by close friends. And this could be photos you see posted by businesses or other entities. right? Um, and so uh, these experiments induce some sort of variation in these two variables. And we're going to try to use that variation to uh, estimate the effect on some third variable, for example. Now, many of these variables are correlated with each other. Changes that, that affect one of these endogenous variables end up affecting another, often through substitution patterns. right? Like if you show me more of one thing and I have a fixed budget of time, I might see less of another thing. Okay. Um, so they're positively, uh, you know, uh, actually the, not the means, but the observed. Uh, versions of these variables are positively correlated in observational data. Also, the means are correlated as well. Um, we can also see that basically this is really highly non-normal data. Right? There's just way too many of these points that are kind of crazy far out here compared with this point. Um, and we'll see more of that later. So how are we going to do analysis of this sort of data? Well, basically, we're back to this kind of setting. We're going to have some growing number of experimental groups, K. And then we have some number of observations per group. Um, so uh, the standard asymptotics for instrumental variables would usually have a fixed number of instruments. That is, k is fixed. And then n goes to infinity. So the total number of observations goes to infinity. And thus, also the number of observations per experiment goes to infinity. I think that's not really as relevant to our setting. In our setting, what we're thinking about is we're accumulating more and more experiments. And in fact, if you end up with more people, you start slicing the people into more and more experiments so that you can learn about more and more different treatments simultaneously. Right? And so we're going to really think about a different set of asymptotics. Okay. Um, no, I think I'll skip over some of this. Okay. So how we're kind of thinking about this and, and how this motivates one of our estimators that we're going to use 
the, the, in particular the regularization we're going to use, is to think about this kind of a model of experimentation. Actually, a lot of the experiments that people run don't do anything. Now, um, this could be because uh, actually they, it's not that they don't do anything at all. They just do something very, very small. Uh, so it's, it's approximately nothing. It could be that somebody says, hey, what if we turn this knob? And it turns out that knob is not connected to anything at all. Um, it could be also that somebody is, in fact, trying to run an experiment that does nothing. Uh, they have tried to, say, remove a whole bunch of complicated code. And they're hoping that everything ex is exactly the same as it was before. They just sort of simplified some code for, for human purposes. Right? So there's some fraction p of the experiments that basically are hidden control groups. Okay? Now, the, the remainder of them are actually substantial explorations of the parameter space. Now, if we were to just, if we actually had only null experiments, and we tried to do this estimation of these effects of, of x on y using instrumental variables, we're going to end up with a, a parameter estimate of, of beta that looks like this, that has this large bias term. And in fact, this is just the same as if we did our estimation using purely observational data. We have no truly random variation that we've induced in these causal variables, and so we're not improving over the, over the observational analysis. If we use the larger explorations, we get this term where we now have this, this uh, additional term in the denominator that's going to make this whole bias smaller. Okay. So looking at this data, this certainly seems like that might capture a bit of what's going on here. Not only are these highly non-normal, but there's a whole bunch of clumping right here. These are the QQ plots for each of the seven dimensions that we're looking at. And you see that basically this is really not normal, and there's a lot really close to zero. They have very heavy tails. So kind of inspired by this model of experimentation, this motivates a particular regularization procedure. Uh, so one idea is basically just remove experimental groups from our analysis that are mostly noise, that are essentially null experiments. Right? Um, and so if we think of uh, our data set as being vectors of group level observations, so x uh, bar g. That's the multivariate mean of all these causal variables uh, for group G, and Y, G is, the, is the, um, the mean of the outcome. For each of these, because we know a lot about the observational distribution of these variables, we can just uh, compute a p-value um, under the null of no intervention. What's the probability of seeing x bar G if actually this experiment does nothing at all? Okay? And then uh, either we can, uh, we can somehow threshold these p-values. Either we shrink uh, large p-values, uh, we shrink those groups to zero, or we just remove them entirely. We could just remove them from our data set and only work with our experiments that really are substantial explorations of this parameter space. Okay. So uh, say we create some new variable um, x bar q g. That's going to be for some threshold q, the version where we've just replaced um, x bar g with zero, assuming we've already centered all the data. Um, if, uh, if the p-value is too large. And then instead of doing our standard two-stage least squares estimation, we're just going to do this estimation with, um, with these modified versions of x. Okay. So this is sort of motivated by this DGP, but actually this just corresponds to uh, L0 regularization. So this is a, um, uh, a group sparse uh, regularization path that we've induced for the first stage. Um, of this estimation procedure. Um, usually, people think about an L0 penalty um, that is uh, just directly trying to induce sparsity as being intractable, because you need to search over um, some combinatorial number of possible coefficients that you could allow uh, to not be 0. Here, uh, this actually is going to be um, tractable, because we have these disjoint groups. So we essentially, this reduces to computing these p-values uh, for each experimental group separately. Um, this fits into a bit of a larger literature on regularization methods for instrumental variables, including using an L1 penalty in the first stage. Uh, they only consider a single endogenous causal variable. Um, and um, people doing random effects models of experiments, which is so that's shrinkage using some sort of a Gaussian model. We consider shrinkage also using a, a T model. Um, you could also do L2 regularization, which is going to be really related to this Gaussian model as well. Um, when you do regularization, uh, we often, I mean, certainly in the machine learning community, uh, choose our level of regularization empirically in a data-driven way, say, using cross-validation. But how do we do cross-validation here? Right? Can we just do our sort of normal cross-validation procedure? 
And um, our answer is basically no. Um, the reason to think about that is that uh, what would happen if we use this cross-validation procedure um, and we, in fact, had experiments that were totally uninformative? What would happen? Essentially, we end up not doing enough regularization and we start recovering biased, um, uh, confounded observational estimates. And so instead, we propose a different cross-validation procedure. Um, and so uh, we're going to uh, do cross-validation with an IV-relevant causal loss function. And so this is going to be related to a loss function that's, that's, um, uh, that's minimized by some other procedures where you do sample splitting in a particular balanced way. Um, so it's going to look like this. In particular, let's split each level of Z, that is each experimental group, into uh, V folds. Call these new data sets um, uh, uh, X, XV, YV, ZV. And then we're going to compute the per level means uh, for each of those groups. So basically now we have not just the overall group level mean, but we have the, the mean for um, that fold of that level of Z. Then uh, when we compute beta hat, we're going to estimate this uh, using all folds but V. Um, and then compute our predictions um, using all folds but V. But then we evaluate it on this held out fold V. Okay, what's different about this than, than our normal cross-validation procedure? In particular, we've split uh, things uh, such that each level of Z, each experimental group, gets split it into multiple pieces. And we're going to evaluate the, the prediction formed uh, using uh, one fold on another fold but from the same experimental group. This breaks the confounding relationship between uh, X and Y that's caused by uh, U, these common causes that I've shown before. Um, and this is actually good. So um, if, if you look at this applied just in one dimension to which threshold we'd pick, this loss function uh, that, that we uh, are, are promoting here, IVCV, uh, is really close to the actual causal loss function, unlike doing cross-validation in the first stage or in the second stage alone. So um, how this works and how we're going to evaluate this with, with real data uh, is this is uh, data from, from these um, around 800 different experimental conditions. We're going to uh, use these experimental conditions essentially to run realistic simulations. One of the challenges in doing causal inference compared with a lot of other machine learning topics right, is that the quantities of interest are not observable. We can't just keep a holdout set and say we're going to evaluate things on that holdout set because what we care about are these unobserved counterfactuals. So um, when we do uh, things to try to evaluate new methods in, in the area of causal inference, it's a little bit more difficult. Uh, so here we're going to uh, use this realistic data set um, to uh, tell us about what the structure of these experiments look like. Then we're going to add our confounding noise using a real correlation structure um, and generate the outcomes according to a known model so that we know what the true causal effects are that we're trying to estimate. Okay. So here's what these simulations look like. I'll walk, I'll walk through this. So um, we do this in either two, four, or seven dimensions, which is the dimension, dimensionality of the original data that we started with. Let's think about just two dimensions. So this black line is the regularization path that we just introduced, this, L, this uh, L0 group sparse regularization path. So when there's no regularization, it's going to coincide with this basic procedure, two stage least squares, just fitting that line through the points, essentially. Um, as we add regularization, it can diverge from that. So here we're re uh, evaluating how much bias our estimates of beta have um, compared with just if we didn't use uh, these experiments at all. And we see that that bias drops as we add this regularization. So this is actually sort of a reverse bias variance trade-off. Right? Usually you think when you add regularization, you reduce variance and add bias. But generally here, because we're adding regularization in this first stage, which is sort of like a denominator, uh, this ends up functioning uh, in reverse. So, um, so here, as we add regularization, we reduce bias. And actually, it turns out that, in fact, even in terms of mean squared error, this pays off. Right? We don't add too much variance. Um, and so uh, uh, for much of the regularization path, um, this procedure reduces uh, mean squared error uh, relative to uh, two stage least squares, and actually, in general, also relative to other methods, and, and gets close to an oracle that would know 
uh, the true effects of each experiment on the, the endogenous causal variables. Okay. So uh, to look at this from a different perspective, uh, we can think about what happens as we actually increase our number of experimental groups um, holding the dimension fixed. So here we have these seven endogenous variables, and we're just getting more and more experiments. What happens? Well, uh, here's mean squared error uh, relative to the, to the observational estimates, which are just going to be uh, uniformly bad. Um, Two-stage least squares not doing this regularization is not even consistent. You can kind of see that this is not, doesn't have root end convergence. Uh, on the other hand, uh, by using this um, L0 regularization with the, the, um, uh, the penalty feasibly selected using um, our cross-validation procedure, we are able to um, uh, substantially reduce mean squared error and, and have something that looks a lot more like uh, root end convergence. OK. So I'm pretty much uh, out of time, but I'll, I'll kind of wrap up and, and try to link some of these things together a little bit and mention a few other things. So um, we've done a lot of additional simulations uh, with synthetic data. We just, I just focus on the real data or the kind of partially real data here because I think that's a bit more interesting and kind of motivates the problem. But uh, similar results show up if you have, say, uh, experiments that are T distributed or something like that. Um, this fits in, as I said, with these existing regularization methods. Um, you could also imagine, I mean, if we look um, back at this picture, it's not so much that there's just kind of clumping here and that then there's this long tail distribution. There's also a lot of clumping out here, right? Like, why are these points so close to each other? That should not be happening, right, if this was something like a T distribution, right? So not only might there be hidden control groups in the data, but there's hidden replications, right? Uh, that you and I both end up running similar experiments. Or actually, I've just run a series of experiments where I've tried to iterate on my new newsfeed algorithm. Right? So um, we might want to use a regularization method that also exploits that structure. And so um, you could certainly do something fully Bayesian, like using um, some sort of uh, you know, mixture of Dirichlet processes or something like that. Um, uh, you could also use a uh, regularization path formed by clustering. So we actually try doing that, where here uh, we just sort of uh, take all the experiments, run a clustering algorithm on them, and then replace their group means with their cluster means. And so this also induces re a regularization path, and we can see that it has some similarly nice properties. Okay. So uh, more generally, one of the, the, I think, the things that we contribute in this work is uh, proposing this cross-validation procedure for instrumental variables, uh, which allows uh, doing data-driven selection of things like regularization parameters in a setting where the existing cross-validation procedures would kind of lead you astray and cause you to dramatically under-regularize. So uh, more generally, I think this uh, kind of highlights, uh, oh, I was going to show this empirical example. So now if we actually apply this to the real data, here's um, 300 experimental conditions from the setting I've been talking about. Um, here is the uh, mean squared error in, in this IVCV cross-validation as a function of our regularization parameter. So it's minimized here. Um, we then can look at our estimate of in a particular in-kind peer effect. So this is something like, if I see more photos, do I produce more photos? You know, producing content of the same type. Um, and then we get a, a, a positive est estimate from that. In this particular case, it turned out we actually had a bunch of pretty useful experiments in here. So the regularization is not that necessary. But especially if you start increasing the dimensionality of x, this can become more important. Um, more generally, I, I think that my goal here is to kind of to introduce uh, some of these ideas of, of how you'd go about learning about peer effects in networks, what you can do when you design a specific experiment, and the degree to which now, because we just have so many randomized experiments, uh, that are being constantly conducted, whether we can uh, use essentially that experimental data exhaust to improve causal inference for purposes, other purposes. Okay, so um, I just want to uh, thank my co-authors, Renee, Aton, and, and and Alex, and um, yeah, thanks for having me.
I think we definitely should be worried about, um, yeah, so I think uh, one question is about being worried about some small bias um, producing the effects that we're observing. And I think that's actually one of the big reasons to be trying to take causal inference seriously here. Because the, the confounding that we could get from doing an observational analysis, even if there's only a little bit of it remaining, could be enough to swamp some of these uh, smaller effects. So certainly, I think causal inference is a lot easier when you have really powerful treatments. Um, and so that's, that's definitely true. And, and here, a lot of the treatments aren't necessarily power, that powerful. Um, so one point I would want to make is that uh, when we talk about small versus large effects, one of the things that we're doing here is that we have, say, in this first experiment I showed, the first stage effects are really small. That is, the effects of this treatment assignment um, to this encouragement on how much feedback people are receiving. Those effects are super small, right? And I was, I was proud of that. I was like, these effects are really small. And, um, but those aren't the effects that we're actually trying to estimate. That's just the, essentially the denominator that we're going to divide by. And so actually, the effects that we observe in the second stage, the effects of feedback received on other things can be quite large. We've just only produced this tiny shock to feedback received. And it's precisely because we have a large sample size that we're able to, to relatively precisely estimate this. So uh, one of the big concerns in instrumental variables analysis usually is weak, weak instruments, that um, you have this, this instrument that does produce some sort of a, a shock to the endogenous causal variable, but it doesn't produce that much of a shock to it. Um, and that can be a problem and produce a lot of bias. And that's actually essentially what we're trying to solve in this whole later part, is that we have a whole bunch of weak instruments, and we want to eliminate them. But here, uh, these instruments are not, in any statistical sense, weak. They're substantively weak, but statistically, we still have this very large F statistic. And so we don't get the, the bias from weak, weak instruments that you would normally have, which usually the cutoff people would use here is more around like 30 or 50 or something like that. So, um, so yeah, that's definitely an issue. And, and I think also what effects are large or what effects are not large is a, is a kind of up to people's interpretation. That's part of the reason why I showed these effects. This is kind of the largest thing you could possibly imagine in terms of a uh, behavioral uh, outcome that we'd be moving. And these are just one order of magnitude off. So I would regard these effects as being then pretty substantial. Um, right? They're like a tenth of the largest possible effect you, would, you could see happening. So, um, so I think a lot of times in this case, it's, it's useful to think about that scale. Also, an, another point on, on sort of effect size is to think about how this matters for managers and how it matters for public policy. And so in some of my um, other work, uh, we've uh, conducted experiments involving voter turnout, small effects uh, multiplied by, say, the number of voters who are exposed to an encouragement to, to turn out uh, could end up meaning that hundreds of thousands of people vote who would not have voted otherwise. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I don't know that much about the microbiome. Uh, I would say, I would say one of the the differences there um, is that the, the the way that the the endogenous causal variables are structured is very different. So here, I mean, if we think about um, think about how these variables are related, and we define these these are like counts of categories of objects. Now. That's not obviously the, the real uh, sort of dimensionality of the endogenous variables here. I'm getting exposed to all kinds of things in newsfeed. It depends on whether this photo is like blurry or well taken or all these kinds of things are affecting me. Um, and so you might try to somehow expand the dimensionality of that, and then you need more experiments. In the case of the microbiome, a bunch of the structure, uh, it, has, it has a similar kind of compositional structure, um, though in fact, actually, it's like almost completely compositional because we generally can't estimate like total counts of these things very effectively. Whereas here, you can have this thing where somebody just, as a result of this change, maybe spends way more time on Facebook. And so the consumption of everything goes up. Whereas in the microbiome, you probably can only, usually only have compositional data. Um, and then the kind of structure that you have might be um, 
provided by biological theory. Um, but there might also be all kinds of competitive um, and uh, sort of cooperative relationships. There may be substitution relationships among two different bacteria. Um, but there uh, might also be um, some kind of synergies between two different bacteria where um, uh, you know, the existence of one is supporting the other in some way. So, um, so there's a bunch of questions there. I don't, know, I, I don't know actually how to deal with that all. But you, you would need to do some sort of guided dimensionality reduction in order to solve that. Because obviously, the dimensionality of the composition of, say, the human microbiome is really high dimensional. And often what people care about is discovering you know, new important things in that high dimensional space. Yeah. So the, the stuff that's part of the uh, the group lab that's going to be mm -hmm. So do you have to manually select the random variables as experiments or it's like the experiments which are like weak instruments? Mm -hmm. They automatically get clustered. No, so they they automatically get clustered. So the basic idea is say if these were our only two dimensions, and I think maybe I have this picture a little bit farther along, is that there's just these from the observational data, right? we know what the distribution of these points should be if there was no experiment. And so these are the p-value contours. And so essentially, the regularization path just takes points within each of these contours and either throws them out entirely, or what we really do is just shrink them exactly to 0. Um, so, uh, and that regularization path just is the, the, the group sparse regularization path. Um, we sort of motivate it through this p-value story because this is like, um, in practice, an easy way to compute this with this group level data. Um, and it sort of is motivated by this DGP. But it ends up just corresponding exactly to um, the L0 path. But since we have this constraint that basically we're going to, for, for a particular experiment, we either keep the whole experiment or we shrink or remove the whole experiment. And whether we make that decision for that experiment doesn't affect whether we make the decisions for any of the other experiments. That makes the whole thing computationally tractable in a way that um, uh, L0 regularization uh, is not often tractable. 